find. But I want us to come to this story that is so, so familiar to us, and we're going to look at some of the questions of Easter, because what struck me as I began to read over and over and over was that the Easter story, the, 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 uh, the crucifixion, the suffering of Jesus, the resurrection, is full of questions. It's full of questions. It really is. If you read, that's what you'll see. There are questions just peppered throughout the story. And as I began to read it in that light, read the stories in that light, um, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to, to look at these questions and what, the, and what the questions lead to in a different way this morning. So I want to talk about, I want us to look at the Easter, some Easter questions this morning. There are many more than we will look at, but we're going to look at some of them and, uh, this morning. And I want us to begin with not a direct question, but an implied question, and it is from Jesus in the garden, and then later on the cross. And, and if I were to ask you some of the famous questions related to the Easter story, you could name some right now, couldn't you? Think about it just a minute. What are some questions that you know about the Easter story? Okay, group participation now. Can you think of any? Say them out loud. What do the disciples say that night when Jesus says to them, one of you is going to betray me? What's the question? Is it I? Is it I? Surely not I, Lord. That's one of the questions. What is one of the questions uh, that Pilate asks? Okay. Uh, what is truth? Or other questions as well, right? That one is, what does Jesus ask from the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so we have some of these very these questions that we know so very well. But I want us to begin in the garden. It's the question in the garden, and then it will be the question from the cross as well. And this is um, this is an implied question. They've just finished what we call the Last Supper. They certainly didn't call it the Last Supper, right? Jesus knew what it was. The disciples did not really know, even though Jesus told them very clearly uh, what was coming. Uh, he has warned them, one of you is going to betray me. And uh, not only Judas, but each one of the disciples, if you read, you'll see that each one asks him in turn, probably privately, not, not me, Lord, is it? Is it I? And I thought, how beautiful of the Lord to provide an opportunity for his disciples to consider themselves and their own heart in relationship to him. Peter has already very boldly and very foolishly proclaimed, don't worry, Master. We, we know, and we love to pick on him, don't we? Don't worry, Master. Though all these, I'm, I'm using my translation, though all these other guys, though all these other yahoos, they may, they may leave you, they, even if they run away, don't worry, Jesus, I've got your back. I will go with you to prison and even to death. Um, foolishly, depending on his own strength, which is what we do as well sometimes, right? And we always get into trouble when we depend on our own strength, right? How many of you have ever, ever gotten in trouble when you depended on your own strength? Or is it just Pastor Jennifer? That's right, all of us do, all of us do. What a lesson, and that's why we gotta be careful about pointing a finger at our brother Peter. Because uh, if we read other parts of the, of the story, uh, not only Peter says that, all the others then say, they don't wanna be upstaged by Peter, right? Then all the other disciples say, me too, Lord, me too, me too, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. All of them do the same thing. So all of that has just happened, and then Jesus, Judas has gone off to do his dirty deed, and Jesus, Jesus leads his group out in, into the night, into the garden that we call Gethsemane, but it's not a flower garden as, as we are used to. Um, it's an olive grove, and apparently it's a place that is very familiar to them, and it's a place that's familiar to others as well. Jesus and his disciples often go there in the night, and they often pray there in the night hours and fellowship in the night hours. So Jesus takes them part way, and then he takes Peter, James, and John, the inner circle, a little bit further, as he often did, right? Jesus had a special relationship with this, these three. He, he, he in, it seems that he invested more in them but he also required more of them. A lot of times we look at people that we think are God's favorites. Have you ever looked at someone before that you thought they're, they're God's favorites? 
God doesn't play favorites, but I will say God looks at our hearts and God invests more in the heart that is more drawn after him and more open to him. But the other side of that coin is where God invests more and gives more, he expects more also. He does. He expects more. And so he takes Peter, James, and John, and then he goes a little bit further, a stone's throw. So about as far as you could throw a stone. Some of you can throw it very far, some not so far. And then Jesus goes a little bit further to spend time alone with his father. And this is the time when Jesus, as he's praying, he says, my father, my father, as it, or Abba father, or as we would say very commonly today, daddy. That's what it means. And um, maybe all of us in our, in our mother tongues, we have, we have familiar words for, uh, for our fathers, don't we? If we're very, very formal, we say father. Um, but most of us don't use that word when we're talking to our father, right? Our fathers would look at us like, what's wrong with you, right? <laughs> we have common names. And so, and so Jesus says, Daddy. That, that really is what it means as he prays. And because his heart is growing heavier. So let's look at, um, I've, just, I've just explained that. So he goes further. Look at verse 38. He tells them, my soul is, is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Peter, James, and John, he asks them. He, he says that to them. And then we see what happens next. So he's, he goes on to pray, and he falls face down. And here's the implied question. You won't see a question mark here, but there's an implied question here. And it's the question of the garden. And he says, if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. My father, he cried out. Everything is possible for you. If it's possible, please take this cup away from me. Yet I want your will to be done and not mine. So there's an implied question there. Jesus is asking the Father, is there any other way? He is determined to do what is needed to save you and me. That's, that's, that's his determination. But the price he's going to have to pay is so awful to him, is so heavy to him, that he asks God, God, is there any other way? Is there any other way? But I'm going to do what your will is. Because he's determined to pay the price. Because if he doesn't pay the price, all people of all eternity will be lost. You and I would have no hope this morning, no hope whatsoever. And not just us, but all people. And so he's determined, but the question is, is there any other way? Is it possible? We know this so well. And, and so as we look at this, we say, okay, Jesus is praying. He doesn't want to be, um, if, if I were to ask you, what is Jesus praying? If I, if I were to ask a lot of people, what is Jesus praying here for? Do you know what many, many people would say? And many Christians would say. They would say, Jesus is praying that he doesn't, to, to be spared crucifixion because crucifixion is so awful. That's what a lot of people would say, right? Some of us may feel that way as well. How many of you have seen uh, the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ? Okay, almost all of us have seen that. What is the focus of that movie? If you think about it, it may be a while since you've seen it. The primary focus of that movie is the physical suffering of Jesus, isn't it? The, the focus on, on the blood and on the, 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 uh, the thorns and the scourging and the cross. And it's awful. It's, it's truly awful. But what I want to say to you this morning is that's not really the focus of what Jesus is going to do. Because we look at that and we think, oh, it was, it was so awful. It was so awful. And he prays once. He prays again. He prays a third time, and the disciples are so overcome with sleep and with grief, they just fall asleep. <laughs> All, every time they fall asleep, but Jesus keeps praying because he knows what's coming ahead. And so a lot of us think, well, he's praying, oh, God, if there's any way that I, I won't be crucified. And I don't know about you, but I would pray not to be crucified also, wouldn't you? Yes, all of us would pray that, so I'm not making light of that. But what I want us to understand this morning is this. Rome was a cruel conqueror, and 
70 years before Jesus was crucified, there is a record in Roman history that 2,000 Jews were crucified in one day for the entertainment of a Roman general. 2,000 in one day. 30 years after Jesus was crucified, Ro uh, uh, Jew Roman historical records also show that 500 Jews a day, it was after the rebellion, that's when Jerusalem was destroyed, 500 Jews a day were crucified because of their uprising against Rome. In fact, the, the historical records state that there were so many crucifixions that they ran out of trees. So many trees were cut down for it. And so there has to be something more than crucifixion because crucifixion was a cruel and terrible but common part of Roman punishment. And it was designed to, hu to humiliate and to frighten and to make sure nobody rose up against Rome. If you rise up against Rome, you will be crushed. You will be crushed. And so is that what Jesus is praying for? I don't think that's what Jesus was praying for at all, although he knew that it would be terrible. I believe Jesus was praying for something more. And the greatest agony of Jesus was not the physical, but let's look at some scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For God made Christ, who never sinned, and knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's what Christ was praying about. Look with me at another scripture, and I'm going through this quickly. Galatians 3.13. Christ has rescued and redeemed us from the curse of the law. When he was hung on the cross, he became a curse for our wrongdoing, for it's written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. And then look at, the, look at Isaiah. This is one we know so very well. I'm using a slightly different translation. Yet it was our sicknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. Stop there just a minute. Have any of you, I know you have, have any of you ever been very, very sorrowful or grieving about something? Have you before? Yes. What did it feel like? You felt crushed, didn't you? You felt crushed. Imagine the crushing burden of Jesus taking all the sorrows, all the sorrows. Let me ask you another question. When you have sinned and fallen short of God's righteous standards, have you ever felt guilt before and great contrition? Oh, I can't believe I did that. I, I can't believe I said that. Oh, I wish I could take it back. I wish I could take it back. Remember how you felt? Imagine Jesus taking all of it on himself. That's what Jesus was praying for in the garden. It wasn't, oh God, I don't want to be crucified, although he didn't want to be crucified. It was so much more than that. And it says, he was pierced for our rebellion and crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is what Jesus was praying about in the garden that night. It was so much more than, oh God, I don't want to be crucified. It was all of this. And I want us to think this morning, and this is why when he is taken to the cross a few short hours later, and God lays all of this on him in a way that we don't even understand. I, I don't know how it happened. I don't know how, I don't know how the exchange happened. And, and you don't either. It's, it's something that we won't really understand more fully until we get to heaven. But for those hours as he hung on the cross, and especially those three hours when darkness fell, I was thinking of that, weren't you? Friday and Saturday when it was so dark outside. Did you think of that? I, I really did. I was thinking of the darkness of, of the day of crucifixion, and I thought, Lord, it, it's almost like you're giving us a taste, a little bit of it. And as, as he became sin and bore our sin and paid for our sin and suffered for our sin, all of that as the Father turned his face away. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God had to. 
God had to because of sin. And so as Jesus was facing that, and he was facing the burden, here is how the Holy Spirit led me to think of these questions. Because here was Jesus who knew no sin, who had felt no sin, who had never been separated from the Father. And the agony of that was almost more than he could, he could bear. The agony of that was so great. He said, oh God, oh my Father, if there's any other way so that I don't have to ha take this sin on me when I've never known sin, so that I don't have to be separated from you even for a short time, is there any other way? And this is what the Holy Spirit led me to think as we think about that question. Here is Jesus in the garden who is agonizing and sweating almost like drops of blood as, as he struggles with this with this sin, with the burden of sin, and with the guilt of sin. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. And I know this is a little bit heavy as we start out, but it's so important this morning, and I believe this is one of the messages for us from the Holy Spirit. My question is this. We look at how Jesus faced that, and then I think of us as children of God. How often do you and I bear our sin, carry our sin, hold it in our heart, come into church, raise our hands, praise the Lord, and walk out and revile our neighbor and gossip and, and, and hold bitterness and hold unforgiveness and excuse that because, well, it's just the way I am. And, it, and we're not convicted at all. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad this morning. I'm really not. I, I believe this is the message that, that the Holy Spirit has for us. But as I was thinking about that, I, it, it struck me afresh. And he was like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Jesus agonized for that. And me, sometimes, I'm happy to live with it. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't even think about it when I hold a grudge, when I bear unforgiveness. And so I believe one of the things for us to think about this morning as children of God, especially, is this. Remember Jesus in the garden and think of the question that he asked and agonized over and then go to the Lord and say, oh God, oh God, don't let me hold on to anything. Don't let me casually and easily let sin remain in my heart or habits and li lifestyles and things in my heart that caused you such pain and agony. Lord, may it cause me pain and agony also so that I will deal with it, so that I'll take care of it, so I won't let it stay in my heart and in my life when it caused that for you. Does, it, does that make sense to us this morning? Yes. I, I hope it does. I hope it does. So that's the question of the garden. That's the question of the garden. But there's some other questions as well that I want us to look at. And I want us to, to think about the questions of the courtyard, okay? What are the questions of the courtyard? The questions of the courtyard have to do with one man, my buddy. The one that I learned so much from. You know who it is, right? Who is it? It's our friend Peter. It's the questions of the courtyard. Uh, Peter has already run away as Jesus was arrested in the night um, after this moment. Why? Well, because he was pride and a haughty spirit come before fall, and Peter had both of them, didn't he? He had pride and a, holy, and a haughty spirit, and he was sleeping when he should have been praying, right? He kept on falling asleep, and, and Jesus warns him. Jesus says, watch and pray so you don't fall into temptation. How many times has Jesus warned us, and we ignored him too, right? And Jesus, Jesus knows what's ahead, so Jesus has been arrested, and to his credit, Peter does not stay away. He then follows after with John. Um, you say, is John's name in there? John's name is not in there, but it's John. Um, and Peter follows along with John, and he's in the courtyard. And this is the part that's going to be difficult for you because it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Ying's going to have to do the best he can. So I'm not going to read it all because it's long, but let's look at some of the passages. And I've taken out most of the, uh, I've taken out most of the uh, uh, scripture references, it's, but it's found on, in all of those places. So it's cold outside, and the servants and the guards 
light a charcoal fire in the middle of the courtyard. They sit around it. Peter goes out there as well. We know this so well. And a servant girl. By the way, when it says servant girl, do you know what that means? Somebody young. Probably a slave girl. Somebody young. Not a soldier. Not a guard. Not a mature woman. A little servant girl. Looks at Peter. And here's question number one. Now, some of them say... Uh, it's a declaration, but I think it's John. That's what I thought you were going to say. In John, I, or Luke, in Luke, it's a question. And she says, you're not one of those man's, that man's disciples, are you? No, he said in front of everyone. I am not. I don't know what you're talking about. Ouch. Question number one. Question number two. He's standing there by the fire. They ask him again, say, you have a Galilean accent, and that man Jesus is from Galilee. Aren't you one of his disciples? What happens this time? This time, he denies it with an oath. Here when it says oath, it's not a swearing word, but it's an oath. It would be something like, as God is my witness. Or you know when we, if somebody goes to court and they put their hand on, well in the U.S. usually we put our hands on the Bible or something like that. And we swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Okay, that's in the U.S. at least. And this time he makes an oath and he says, oh, ouch. Look at the words. He says, I don't know the man. So dismissive, right? So, so, psh, I don't know the man. Here's Peter, one of the inner circle. And then, finally, one of the household slaves. Oh, you know, be sure your sins will find you out. Who was the one that psh, tried to cut off, not tried to, he did. He tried to kill the guy, but he cut off the ear of, the, of, the, uh, of one of the servants in the garden to try to defend Jesus with force even though there were millions of angels in heaven that could have done that. Um, Peter said, I'll help you, because he was depending on his own strength. And a relative, uh, that's pretty dramatic, right? Somebody's ear gets whacked off and then miraculously put back on. That story would spread pretty fast, right? That would make it to South China Morning Post. Um, and he says, didn't I see you in the olive grove? It's, it's the relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. Um, by the way, yeah. He says, didn't I see you out there in the olive grove? This time, Peter curses. We don't know what type of curse it was, but it's a curse. And you can imagine, I mean, the curses that we have today. So it would have been a curse. And then an oath again. And immediately, he says, I don't know the man. The rooster crows. Oh, and to me, this is the saddest part of the story. It really is. This is sadder than when Judas kisses Jesus. Because this is Peter. This is his best friend. This is his close companion. And the Lord turns and he looks at Peter because it, part of it would have been open air. And the rooster, the rooster crowed and immediately Peter remembers what Jesus said. And Peter broke down, weeping bitterly, and he leaves the courtyard and he leaves Jesus. So, that was, so there's, there's the third question. And for me, these three questions point to this, but it's a wonderful thing instead. But it takes a while to get to the wonderful. We look at this, and I don't know about you, but here's the question I would have. How do you come back from something like this? How do you recover from such a failure? Have you ever failed really, really, really badly? Have you ever failed terribly? Have you ever felt, well, that's it. There's no hope. It's over. I'm done with. I think that's what Peter must have felt. Do you know why I can say that? I say that because on the resurrection morning, when Jesus comes back um, and the angels appear to the women and they say, go tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is alive. At this point, Peter's not even part of the group anymore. I'm sure he had isolated himself. I'm sure he had thought, I am washed up. I'm done for. There's no chance for me, and there's no hope for me. And then, when the story goes a little bit further, stay with me, when the story goes a little bit further, and they start saying, Jesus is alive. He appeared to the ladies. He did this. He did that. Do you know what it says in the, in the resurrection story? It also says, and he has appeared to Peter. Wait a minute. 
What do you mean he appeared to Peter? Where is that in the Bible? Where is the record of that interaction? Where's the record of that meeting? It's not there. Nevertheless, Jesus went and found Peter where he was in his shame, in his sorrow, in his hopelessness, in his despair, and in his defeat. And Jesus made it right with Peter. And Jesus forgave him, and Jesus restored him. Do you th what, can you imagine what that meeting sounded like? Do you think Jesus came with a finger outstretched? Uh-oh, parents, have you ever done finger outstretched to your children? <laughs> we, we shouldn't, but we probably do, right? I've tried it on my cats, but it doesn't work. <laughs> but sometimes we do it with our children, don't we? I told you, right? We sometimes think, do you think Jesus did that? Peter, I told you you should have watched and prayed and not slept, but see, so I told you so. Do you think Jesus said, I forgive you because I'm Jesus? We sometimes think that, don't we? But you're going to have to be on probation for a while because you blew it so badly. We laugh, but you know what? That's what we think sometimes. And that's what we feel sometimes. And the questions to me, and this, this whole story, to me, point to this. If you have blown it this morning, here's the good news. Jesus forgives you. He doesn't embarrass you. He doesn't bring up your past. He doesn't parade your failings in front of everyone. The devil does that. He tries to remind you of how you blew it. Jesus never does it. Jesus deals with you privately. He says, let's take care of it. And so, brothers and sisters, Peter's three questions to me lead us to this. If you've blown it, Jesus forgives you. Jesus forgives you. He forgives you this morning. He forgives you this morning. Amen. Amen. That's true. That's true. But those aren't the only questions. Look at if, let's look at a few more. I told you I was going to go beyond 12, right? Okay. Let's look at, we've looked at the questions of the courtyard. Let's look at the questions of the court. And I, I want to do this quickly if we can. What are the questions of the court? Who are we going to look at? Pilate, right? Let's look at Pilate. And this is where I thought, oh no, Stephen's going to tell my story. Stephen's, Stephen's going to preach my message this morning. Because I also was reading in the, the Gospel of John, um, and this is the one that tells the most about Pilate. The, the story of Pilate all the way through has so many questions. Matthew records seven questions, Mark six, Luke four, John 13 questions. 13 questions. He says, are you the king of the Jews? He says, where are you from? He says, what is truth? He asks the Jewish leaders, what crime has he committed? He asks the crowd, who do you want me to release? And many, many more. And many, many more. We're not going to look at all of those, but I want us to look at Pilate this morning, because brothers and sisters, you and I think we are nothing like Pilate, but I am sad to tell you this morning that we are all like Pilate in some way. So let's look very quickly. Pilate is a shrewd and strategic guy. If Pilate were a politician today, he'd know exactly what's going on, and he'd, set, he'd know which way the wind is blowing, and he'd set his sail so that his boat would get ahead. That's the kind of guy Pilate was. He was hip. He was strategic. He was with it. He knew what was going on. He sees clearly the only reason, the only reason the Jewish leaders have brought Jesus is out of jealousy. It's very clear. So they're just jealous of Jesus and his influence and his popularity. And the other thing that we notice when we look at the passages about Pilate is that Pilate almost seems like a good guy, right? Have you ever read it before? He, he kind of seems like a good guy. How many times does he say, I've questioned him. He's innocent. How many times does he say, listen, I'm going to give you Barabbas instead. Take Barabbas. Barabbas is a notor... Uh, uh, not, not, instead of Barabbas, he says, let's take Jesus. He's pretty smart. He offers them the worst of the worst. Barabbas. A revolutionary and a murderer. Of course they'll choose Jesus. He's pretty smart that way. And so 
we see Pilate trying to get out of it, okay? He's always known what to do. And they bring Jesus, and so he figures, how can I get out of this mess? It's a mess. Jesus is innocent. And he says, okay, he's innocent, but the crowd keeps accusing. They're rowdy and they're unruly. So he's got to figure out, how can I settle this? So first of all, he says, handle it yourselves. And they say, nope, you have to do it. He's a criminal. That's why we brought him for you, brought him to you. He says very directly, he's innocent and they continue to accuse. Then he finds out Jesus is from Galilee. In fact, that's one of the questions. Oh, he's from Galilee? I know what I can do. Herod is visiting in town and Herod is responsible for Galilee. I'll send Jesus to Herod. We'll let Herod handle it. How many of us have tried to pass our problem on to, and we, or we've tried to pass our decision on to somebody else? Let them handle it. We've all tried to do that. Look at this really quickly. Herod, so he sends, him to, he sends him to Herod. Herod was delighted. Look at this very quickly, and this is not even the main point, but it really struck me. Oh, goody, I get to see Jesus. I've heard about him, and I want to see him perform a miracle, like a dog that does tricks at a circus, or, or an elephant that stands on his hind legs, or his front legs, or something like that. Come on, Jesus. And Herod asks him questions, but the questions are only out of curiosity and for entertainment. And Jesus does nothing. I want to say something to you this morning, whether it's you or friends. Jesus today still does not perform or answer or respond to curiosity and entertainment. He doesn't do it. He's above that. But for a heart that's questioning and interested and wanting to know sincerely, even if it's not very deep, but there's a beginning stirring, Jesus will respond. He will, as he did for you. And so Jesus refuses to answer, so Herod sends him back, so Pilate's got the problem again. And so Pilate announces, we think it's, oops, sorry, so Pilate announces uh, a, a, su a suitable solution. I know what I'll do. I will flog him 39 lashes and then I'll release him because he's innocent. What kind of compromise is that? The 39 lashes often killed people. It was a terrible punishment. But Pilate thinks, hey, that's a good compromise. Lashed, I'll set him free. That will satisfy them. And he does it. But it doesn't satisfy. His final ploy is give the crowd a choice. Do you want Barabbas or you want Jesus? And they've been whipped up and they ask for Barabbas instead. In the meantime, his wife sends a message. Pilate, have nothing to do with this innocent and righteous man. I've had a terrible dream about him and I've suffered. Leave him alone. Now, brothers and sisters, here's where you and I are just like Pilate. Pilate's trying to have it both ways. He wants to remain neutral. He wants to stay in the middle. He doesn't want to make a decision. He knows Jesus is innocent, but he's caught and he's trapped. His wife, his family is on one side, just as it is for us sometimes. But on the other side is the pressure of circumstances. And then when it comes to it and a riot is almost about to develop, he looks at it and the people say, the leaders say, if you don't put Jesus to death, you're not a friend of Caesar's. Mm. You think Pilate's going to lose his position and his prestige for a Jewish nobody? No way. But I want to be neutral. And so he washes his hands with water and says he's not guilty. Now, brothers and sisters, this is where you and I are sometimes as well. Not all of us, but sometimes we try to walk a middle road, don't we? We don't want to decide for Jesus because it costs too much. We don't want to go all in because it would require something of our lives. We're going to have to give something up. We're going to have to, get, we're going to, have to let go of some lifestyles. We're going to have to let go of some friends. We're probably going to have to let go of some activities. We're going to have to make some changes. It costs too much. But I want to be a good person. I want to be a good guy. The questions of Pilate tell us this morning this. We cannot be neutral with Jesus. We cannot be neutral with Jesus. 
The most important question that Pilate asks is this, what should I do with Jesus? And that's your question, and that's my question as well. And I want to say to you this morning, not for all of you, but there's some of you here this morning, this question is for you. What are you going to do with Jesus? You've tried to be neutral. You've tried to walk a middle road. I'm not all out there bad, but I want to live my own life. And you're caught in the middle like Pilate was. And you think, if I'm good, if I'm relatively good, if I don't do this and I don't do that, I can walk a neutral middle road. And the questions of Pilate tell us we can't. You see, it's not just that Jesus suffered and died and was resurrected. It's not just that it happened. It is what are you going to do? What are you going to do with Jesus? And not to decide is to decide. We can't be neutral with Jesus. We can't. And now as we close this morning very quickly, and I thank you so much for listening so attentively, we come to the last part. It's been a little bit heavy this morning. I want to come to the last part. The questions of Resurrection Day, and this part's going to make you feel better. The questions of Resurrection Day. As the two disciples walk along the road to Emmaus, and I don't even have a scripture for this, I'm just going to remind you of this as we, as we go on, but I want to mention this. Remember this part of the story. The two disciples are walking away from Jerusalem. They're going to Emmaus, and suddenly this stranger appears and starts walking with them. It is Jesus, but they don't know it. Their eyes are blinded to the fact that it is Jesus. And they talk with him, and he talks with them. And he opens scripture to them. And then he's going to keep on walking, and they say, no, no, it's nighttime. Please come, stay with us, eat with us. And they sit down to eat, and Jesus breaks bread. That's what Jesus often did. And their eyes are opened. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And just that quickly, he disappears. Here's the question for you as we come to these very last questions this morning. What do the two disciples say to each other at that moment? Do you remember the question? Their question was this, didn't our hearts burn within us as we heard him speak? And I want to say something to you this morning. Some of you this morning as we have talked about these questions, at certain points this morning, your heart has burned within you. Hey, it's not me. It's not who am I. I'm just as fallen and imperfect and struggling as you are. But if your heart burned within you at some point this morning, that's Jesus. And he's talking to you. And he wants you to deal with some things in your heart. And he's going to help you deal with these things. So if your heart has been burning within you, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And then we come to the last two questions. You ready? Wow, I love these. They're all back in Jerusalem. The women are saying, we, we went to the tomb this morning and, and we saw an angel. And, and the angel said, give this story. And then Mary says, not only did we see an angel, I saw Jesus. Jesus spoke to me. I, I, I touched him. I touched him and I was crying because I said, oh, where is he? Where's his body? Where's his body? And the angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And oh my goodness, there's a whole sermon just in that. Some of us are looking for what is living all among the dead things of this world. They're dead. They can't give us life. They're dead. They're dead. Why are you looking for what can give you life and what is living among what is dead? But come to Jesus. He's alive. Oh, there's a, there's a whole sermon there. Come to Jesus. Stop filling your heart and your life with things that satisfy for one day or one hour or one minute. Jesus satisfies for all eternity. 
Amen. 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 And, and Mary says, and then he said, Mary, he called my name. And I knew it was Jesus, just as you know it's Jesus when he calls your name. And so Mary is telling that. The women are telling that. Peter is there also at this point because he's been restored and forgiven and redeemed. And Peter says, Jesus appeared to me too. I blew it. You all, you, did, you didn't know it, but you know what? I denied Jesus three times that night. I denied him three times. I even swore. I said, I don't even know him. Oh, but Jesus came to me and he forgave me. He forgave me. I can't believe it. He forgave me. And so Peter's telling his story. And the two from Emmaus are there now. And they're saying, we were walking on the road and this man was walking with us and our hearts were burning within us. And then it was Jesus. And as they're in the middle of telling that story, what happens? In the middle of telling that story, Jesus appears in their midst. And we end with the two questions of Jesus. Are you ready this morning? He asks, why are you frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Why are you frightened? I love these two questions. And we are here as well. We're here as well. The disciples look, they can't believe it. It can't be Jesus. Oh my goodness. Now, you and I are judging them right now. I, I feel it. I know you're judging them. You're saying Jesus has appeared three times. Jesus told them he was going to. Why didn't they believe it? Hang on. Hang on to your judgment just a little bit further. And Jesus says, look at my hands. Look at my feet. Touch me. It is really, it's, it's really me. I'm not a ghost. You see? And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. And you and I look at these faithless, doubting disciples, and we judge them. We do, don't we? Go ahead and say, yes, I judge them. <laughs> yes, I judge them. I do too. Here's what the Holy Spirit spoke to me as I looked at these last questions. Jesus told them, I'm going to die, but I'm coming back. Jesus said, don't be afraid. I'll never leave you. And then he dies a terrible death, a, a, a horrible, awful death that they see and they hear about. It can't be true then. Reality is so overwhelming, the words of Jesus and the promise of Jesus cannot be true. It can't be true for me. I guess we thought it was something else. And then Jesus appears and he says, why are you afraid and why are you doubting? I told you. I told you. Here's where we are, brothers and sisters. Oh, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, don't you? Yes, I believe all of this. But do you know what I have trouble believing sometimes? Do you know when I have doubts sometimes? When the waves of my life are swamping over me. When I'm being crushed by depression and I'm thinking, how can I get out of this? <laughs> I'm stuck. When my body is painful. When a friend has betrayed me. When I feel alone. All of us have feared Will I ever get through this? Will I make it? I think I'm not going to make it. All of us have doubted the words of God and the promises of God, haven't we? All of us have. And Jesus says to us this morning as we close, Why are you afraid? Why do you doubt? I keep my word to you. It was written, and, and Jesus ends this part, it was written, it was written, it was written. And the word and the promise and the encouragement of Jesus to us this morning as we close is this. Don't be afraid. Don't doubt. You hold on to Jesus. You go to his word. You pray it back to him. You call on him. You hold on to him. And when the devil lies to you and tells you you've blown it too badly, Jesus won't forgive you. When the devil lies to you and tells you your life will never be better, you might as well end it all. Go ahead. Who cares about you? When the devil lies to you and says it's not worth it to follow Jesus, look what has happened to you when you started following Jesus. Turn your heart to the truth of what Jesus has said, just as he said to those disciples, why are you frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? I have risen just as I said. And everything that Jesus says to you, it is true.
We're going to close this morning with a song. Stephen, I don't know what's – just or, or just play, but I want to close with prayer this morning. Just and, – and we close. If you need to leave, I know it's a little bit later. If you need to leave, please very, very quietly. But I want us to close with prayer. If you don't have to do anything right now, don't do it. Um, if you can hold it, if you need to, to go to the restroom, just hold it. But I want us to – just to take a moment to prayer – to pray – because I know some of us this morning, our hearts have burned within us, haven't they? We know that Jesus has talked with us. And so I'm going to pray for you now, and I want you to pray as well. And Stephen, you just start praying. I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to invite you. You don't have to. You can pray sitting down. But I want to offer you this morning, if Jesus has spoken to you, and you want to respond to him as we sing and as we pray, we're going to pray right now. And you can just quietly stand up where you are. You, it's not a big deal. I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot. But it's, it's a, you're responding to the Lord in your heart. And then we're responding outwardly. And we'll pray for you. Pastor Renee will walk around. He'll pray for you. Others may pray for you around you. But we're going we're gonna to let the Lord as he has spoken to our hearts, touch us this morning. Amen. As I pray for you, would you pray also? Please, don't just sit there passively and listen. God would much rather hear you pray to him than me pray for you. Amen. So just stand if you will. If not just, okay, now everybody stand. You're responding to the Lord this morning. Your heart is burning within you. And there may be people around you standing. You can pray for them. Pastor Renee is going to walk around and pray. And others may wish to pray as well. And we're, let's just take some time this morning as we close. Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah. And if you're doing fine, you pray for somebody else this morning. Jesus, we come to you this morning. We thank you for the, for the story of your, of your suffering and the truth of your suffering and your crucifixion and your death, and your resurrection. Oh, Jesus, oh, Holy Spirit, you put all of these questions in there for us to look at and to learn from. And Lord, we come to you this morning. God, some of us are so afraid. Some of us are so doubtful. We, we, we think it won't get better. I, I'm not going to overcome. I'm going to drown in this storm. And you're telling us, why are you afraid? Why do you have doubts? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Some of you feel just as bad as Peter. And you think, oh God, I have blown it so badly. I've blown it so badly that I, I don't see how you can forgive me. I've asked so many times and, and I even feel ashamed to even think you might forgive me again. But oh Lord, here I am. And Jesus comes to you this morning and he says, if you ask me to forgive you, I forgive you 100%. I don't hold back. I don't put you on probation. I don't say, well, let's see how you do and maybe I'll forgive you. But Jesus, you say, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I love you. Oh, I restore you to myself. I restore you to myself. Some of us this morning, there are Christians here this morning, you've been holding on to things in your life and you need to let them go. It hasn't bothered you at all. You've held on to grudges. You've held on to unforgiveness. You've held on to habits. You've held on to things that nobody else knows about, but you know about. It's time to let them go and give them up with the help of Jesus. It's time to cast aside the things that caused Jesus such agony in the garden and that caused his own father to turn his back on him on the cross. Lord, forgive me for treating it so cavalierly and so casually. These things that brought you such grief and I, it hasn't bothered me at all. Oh, forgive me. Lord, I'm sorry for my hard heart. Make my heart soft again. I repent. I repent. Forgive me. I turn away from these things and I turn to you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus, our hearts burn within us. 
our hearts burn within us because you're speaking to us this morning. We thank you that you're not a God who is dead, but you speak to us today. You answer us today. You forgive us today. Just as you said, you are alive. Hallelujah. You are loving. You are forgiving. You will never forsake us. Lord, those of us that are trapped by habits, Lord, those of us that are in deep depression, Lord, those of us that have thoughts that are so deep and so dark, help us. We come to you. We come to you. We've been trying to handle it on our own, but you are there. You died for us to lift us out of these things. And so we cry out to you, help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. You took those things to the cross so that we would not have to. We come to you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.